them into the chat panel. We will be saving all questions until the end of the presentation. Second, a reminder that we are recording today's session. And last, closed captioning is available throughout today's session. Um, today's presentation uh, is SUNY OER services using OER to reduce barriers, engage students, and to support inclusion. All right, and we're ready to start. Are we all good on your end, Kendra? Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, my name is Corey Wilhelm. I work with SUNY OER Services, and our presentation today will be a panelist of faculty members from various SUNY institutions. Um, I'll start and give a little bit of introduction first, and then um, and some background on SUNY, and then let them take it away. Um, and I have put our OER email at the bottom of this. I think the way the um, presentation is formatted will probably end without a slide at the end. Um, so I wanted to make sure everyone had that if you have questions. So I will go forward. Um, so for those of you who are not from New York State, um, which is probably most of the people on this uh, presentation, SUNY is the State University of New York system. We are the second largest um, public university system in the country. And we have 64 campuses offering two-year, four-year, all the way up through doctoral granting um, degrees. And we currently have about 400,000 students. As you can see, we have campuses all over the state, um, and they include community colleges. Our colleges of technology are um, applied learning colleges that, again, offer two and four-year degrees, and some offer masters. The comprehensive colleges are more of the um, standard four-year and, and master's institutions. And then our four university centers are um, uh, doc our doctoral see, that, Don't you feel better? Oh, hang on, we gotta mute. Oh, there we go. Um, the university centers are, are research and doctoral granting institutions. And so OER at SUNY um, started way back in 2011 with a few different grant projects. Project Kaleidoscope was one of the first and um, other grant funded initiatives, Achieving the Dream was another. And the goals of those programs were to eliminate textbook costs as a barrier to students in higher ed, to improve course design and materials based on student learning results, and to create a collaborative community that could support and sustain that change. And we saw a lot of um, growth and progress with these different grant-based programs, but there was clear there was a lot of opportunity to grow. So in um, 2017, the New York State Legislature designated $4 million from the state budget for the adoption and creation and promotion of open educational resources across the state. At that time, SUNY OER Services was created, um, and we've grown quite a bit since. We use the money in various ways, and, and this funding has continued each year since 2017. Um, we use it for training and workshops, um, for originally for incentive programs on campus. Um, we gave stipends to faculty for adoption and creation of OER and OER courses. That has since um, ceased, but now we use the funding for different professional development projects and for contracts with open courseware vendors, such as some of the ones on this screen. In 2019, OER Services launched the Ready to Adopt catalog which is at oer.suny.edu. And we now feature over 120 um, high quality OER courses with student focused and um, learning based courseware. We offer four different courseware packages, depending on you know, what set of tools the faculty want to use with OER and what type of learning experiences they wanna have in their classroom. We obviously can't do this all on our own. So this slide, includes our major partners um, for creating the courses and the courseware, hosting open pedagogy projects, and supporting our faculty, instructional designers, and other staff with professional development opportunities in the area of OER. So this is the impact um, that SUNY OER Services has had since 2017. Um, these are some impressive numbers, and we really hope to continue to see them grow. But really, the big one is 
that we've saved our students over $70 million in textbook costs. And we really see that as um, progress toward reducing barriers for students. Lumen Circles, Lumen Learning is one of our partners. Um, and they use um, Lumen Circles as a professional development platform for faculty. Um, they use evidence-based practices to engage um, their students and support student success. There are a number of Lumen Circles available to our faculty, including active learning, teaching using um, OER courseware, open pedagogy, and then um, specifically one in um, belonging and inclusive teaching fundamentals. And that's what we're gonna share more about today. So Lumen developed um, this nine week community of practice. There are 10 to 15 faculty members within each circle. Sometimes there's discipline alignment, such as all psychology faculty, or sometimes it's um, folks from all different disciplines. There's a facilitator who guides the faculty, um, and provides feedbacks, connects the connects peers with each other. Um, and throughout the experience, um, there's a lot of focus on reflective practice. Faculty will try something in their classroom, bring it back to the group and reflect on how it went and make plans for making more changes in the future. This is just kind of a snapshot of how the program is structured and some of the um, areas which the belonging and inclusive fundamentals focuses on. Um, things like mitigating bias, I think, is something we could all use more practice in. Um, and this allows for kind of a non-judgmental way that faculty can work together and um, reflect collectively on that. So I will stop talking and introduce our panelists. These are all faculty members from around SUNY. And so they've all used um, different practices and different experiences to impact their teaching. And I will let them share more about that. I'll kind of just ask some guiding questions. Oh, I'm sorry. So Jesse, Emily, and Zoe, if you'd like to unmute um, and maybe just introduce yourself briefly where you work and what you do there. And we'll start with Zoe. Hi, I'm Zoe Miswich at the State University of New York at Oswego. I'm in the mathematics department where my focus is on the calculus gateway courses, so college algebra and pre-calculus. I supervise those courses and I'm focused on getting, you know, all the students to be successful in these courses. Um, I'm particularly interested in this sort of belonging and inclusivity aspect because in those lower level courses, a lot of students don't feel like they belong in math. And so my goal is to sort of change their perspective and help them feel that they do have a place here as well. Awesome, thanks, Jesse. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jesse Curran from SUNY Old Westbury on Long Island. And um, I'm currently serving as the interim director of our Honors College, but my appointment is actually in our first year experience program. And also I teach in the English department. Um, and like Zoe, I'm really interested, I, I help coordinate the curriculum of our first year seminar. And I found, uh, you know, it's a gateway course, everybody takes it. And I found that there's been wonderful connections between um, the belonging and inclusivity program through Lumen and what we really try to do in the curriculum of our first year seminar. Great, and Emily? Hi, um, I'm Emily Juris at Rockland Community College. Um, I am an adjunct instructor, so I teach college writing one and two. I also teach our um, developmental module for English um, as well as our first year seminar. So we're probably using the same um, <laughs> course for that, Jesse. Um, <clears throat> as it says here on the screen, I'm also coordinating a user testing center, which is you know separate from our discussion today, but it is working with Lumen. So if anybody was interested in hearing more about that, I'd be happy to chat with you. I can send my email or something. Um, but yeah, working with community college students, um, it's just been really exciting to find out what Lumen has to offer. And um, I attended Rockland Community College too, so I have a, a connection there that's exciting. All right, thanks. Um, and for each of you, I'll kind of let you each answer individually. Um, why did you choose to participate in the Lumen Circle and particularly um, in the belonging and inclusive teaching fundamentals? Oh, and I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead, Emily. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, I had been hearing a lot of really good things about Lumen anyway, and I sort of worked with them in other capacities. So um, one of my colleagues introduced me to Circles and I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. But then when I read all the different 
titles that they offer, I was like, oh my gosh, okay, this is really cool. Um, I think I ultimately was swayed just from talking to my colleagues who had already done it, but I specifically chose the belonging circle sort of because that feels like step one for me, even though a lot of times the, the um, suggestion is if you're starting with Lumen Circles, head for the evidence-based teaching one, which I've also done and is fantastic. Um, but for me, I was thinking about like, what is the most important thing that I need to um, sort of have, what is the need that I have to have met baseline before I can think about other steps in my pedagogy? And to me, it was belonging and inclusion. So um, that was ultimately what made me opt for that one. All right, and how about you, Jesse? Okay, hi. Um, so I've done three circles over the course of three semesters. Um, my first was two years ago in the fall, and that was an entirely remote year for me. And I was a complete novice to online teaching and, and in some ways a critic of it. And I just needed to like, I needed to work on it myself. And so I did the um, online foundations, the teaching online foundation circle. And it, it was it was just a wonderful opportunity for me to put my pedagogy into practice and to really learn um, you know, how to, how to transition into an online remote context. Um, I loved it. And then I continued on with active learning. And then I think, um, I think the belonging and inclusivity circle has only been around a year or two, if I'm correct. So it was, you know, once that popped up, I was like, oh, that's what I'm really interested in. And, um, so I did that, I think last, last fall. And, um, that one's really stayed with me and I'm, I'm hoping actually to do it again in the spring. Great. And how about you, Zoe? So I was interested in Lumen Circles in general because I'm always looking for professional development opportunities related to teaching. And I particularly like the format of this one in two ways. So it's an ongoing like nine week program, so you can really get in depth with it. And I like that it's a community of practice. So you're with this group of, I think, 10 to 15 other people and really interacting and reflecting. So that was why Lumen Circles in general. Um, the belonging and inclusivity one, I think it was new or was being advertised in summer or fall 2020 at the time when there was a lot going on just in the world in general about racial justice, you know, George Floyd. So that seemed like it should be a priority for everyone at that time. So that's why I signed up for that one in particular. Great, thanks. And I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to stop the screen share. Um, maybe I'm not. Oh, there we go. Um, there. So um, can you describe what impact um, this has had on your teaching? And are there specific actions you have taken in your class after um, or since engaging in the belonging circle? And um, Zoe, we'll start with you. We'll kind of go back and forth. All right. So this has had a positive impact on my teaching in several ways. First of all, it's just given me more confidence in a lot of the actions that I am taking. So it's very specific about, you know, here are some categories of effective teaching practices, including things like supporting your students and caring about your students. Things that I had sometimes been doing, but thinking, you know, I'm doing this on the side. This isn't really supposed to be the focus of my teaching. And participating in the circle made me much more aware and more deliberate, like this is something I'm doing for pedagogical purposes. I'm reaching out to my students to check on their overall well-being, and it's not a side thing. This is at the heart of my role as an educator. And one thing I like about the circles is they ask you every week or every other week or so to do something very specific. So it's focused on small actions and actually taking these actions. One thing that is going on right now I'm taking another lumen circle on the active no on the evidence-based teaching practices so I'm trying to do something challenging and it gives very basic suggestions like one thing I'm going to implement this week is to ask students to give multiple solutions to some of the questions I ask in class and my goal there is to get students more engaged um, with the students who work faster and the students who work slower if they're not just trying to get to an answer but to you know, have multiple answers, then they have more reason to talk to each other. They have, they all have something to contribute. It's not just, you know, these people finished first and they're done. Now they want to hear from the other students. So it's on the one hand, a very tiny thing, right? Like just saying, I have these questions I want to ask them. Now I'm going to ask them to go back and come up with more ideas and then decide which is the best one. So straightforward to implement, but I think it can be very impactful. Yeah. And I think I'm um, thinking about um, belonging and inclusion and thinking about math, which you teach is, you know, it's kind of a different um, approach. So I think 
that's great that you're including different um, approaches to how the students get their solutions. Um, how about you, Emily? Are there um, any specific actions or how do you feel this has impacted your teaching? Um, I agree with Zoe that one of the biggest elements was sort of just the confidence um, because the environment of the Lumen Circle is very much um, you're thinking about your pedagogy in like a productive way that can be intimidating too. So it was like, oh, okay, I really have to examine everything that I'm doing and um, think about tweaking minor things or maybe major things. And um, so that was like a large impact for me is sort of getting comfortable doing that and being like, oh, it's, it's okay if you look back to two years ago and realize you don't like how you ran that lesson. Like, that's all right, let's fix it. Um, that was one of like the biggest impacts for me. In terms of specific things that I've done, um, I changed so many things, honestly, based on the circle, but just to think of a few, I incorporated questions of the day so once we first everyone gets settled into the classroom before I hop into a lesson, um, I put up behind me on the screen sort of here's our agenda for today, but at the top there's a question of the day and it never has to do with the content of the class. I mean, it might be sort of related, but it's a question about themselves like what's your favorite this, what would you do with this and um, that has really really heavily contributed to a sense of community more than I ever thought it would um, whenever I ask students for their feedback which is another thing the circle encouraged me to do much more often. Um, every single time I get at least five students who are like, this is one of my favorite things about the class that we get to talk with each other at the beginning. Um, just one other thing quickly that I decided to do is I used Hypothesis social annotation um, software to have the students mark up our class syllabus. Um, but like two weeks into the semester. So it's like, hey, remember syllabus day when I read everything and you forgot all of it? Um, let's head back in and see if all of your questions are actually answered on the syllabus. And let's make sure you know what this policy means. And that practice has allowed me to make sure that they know the whole contents of the syllabus, but also that I can change things based on their feedback. So they'll tell me, hey, I really think this policy should be in here. Or what about this? And I can go back and change it. So that's another idea that came out of the circle. That's a really cool idea, letting the students have a little bit of say in the course and how it's going. Um, and Jesse, how about you? Um, so I, I also, Zoe, I, I connect with what you said very much once again, but I, I always felt like caring was important and, you know, the whole student development is always something that's been really central to me, um, but I didn't really have the language to talk about it and didn't realize that indeed there are evidence-based practices that support it. So seeing that, you know, uh, being supportive, caring, bringing enjoyment and creating community, help transitioning students to college experience. That there's a lot of scholarship and, and evidence and research on that and learning how to use that kind of more intentionally and with more confidence and, and kind of being proud that, you know, that's what I do and it's important um, was it was really amazing with the circle. And from that, I mean, two of the facilitators I worked with, uh, Naya Bond and, and one, and I mean, I learned about her work in feminist pedagogy. So there was this like kind of ongoing um, interest of mine that I was able to make a connection with through the circle. And then another facilitator does a lot of work with trauma-informed pedagogy. So for me professionally, that this is really cool because like I'm able to kind of write, I like writing and thinking about pedagogy, but the circle provided a real foundation, um, not only for what I'm doing in the classroom, but also what I'm interested in doing with my own scholarship. Um, and some just like, well, what does it look like in practice in the classroom? You know, that question. One thing we looked at in the um, belonging and inclusivity circle is the matrix of oppression and thinking about the social identity wheel. I don't know if folks are, are um, familiar with these. You can kind of Google them or I can place them in the chat, but uh, it's just an opportunity for students to look at their social identity and, and to take time and think about categories of social identity and, and sort of um, histories of oppression that are built into those identities. And, th and that's in the classroom, whether we talk about it or not. So I, I bring that now into every class, um, no matter what the subject is early on. And I try to have an assignment at some point that speaks to it. So I teach a early European literature class, which, you know, is traditionally pretty homogenous in terms of um, identity, right? It's sort of a white European male tradition. And I asked students to 
think about ways in which components of their identity connects or does not connect to the representation on our syllabus. Um, and, you know, I allow them to give feedback about the course content and to, to open up a conversation, um, even when we have a limited, like, period that we're looking at, and maybe there's not that much flexibility. And this all came from the circle, and, and I find it really um, just helps me grow as an intellectual, as a scholar, but also um, allows us to work on that, as, as Emily said, to sort of work on the syllabus together and see what we can do better, or at least acknowledge what's missing. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I think you've all touched on this already, um, but how have you um, engaged with your students to increase that sense of belonging? Um, do you have any specific, I mean, you just gave one Jesse specific examples, um, but to make students feel more included or that they belong in your classroom. And maybe we'll start with Emily this time. Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, some of like the question of the day, for example, I think would apply to this as well because they, that's like, I'm out, you guys, you guys talk to each other, you share your experiences and I'll ask them questions about um, like their favorite thing about their culture or, you know, like all sorts of different things where they can really get to know each other and relate on, on different parts of their identities, which has been exciting. Um, another simple thing that I do is I'm very open about sharing my pronouns, um, which as you can see, I have like in my name here on Zoom, it's a very easy thing to do. I put it in my email signature. Um, you know, I don't make anyone share that information if they don't want to, but I say, hey, you know, feel free to share this or, you know, I'm teaching grammar. So a lot of times if we're, that'll come up where I'll use a student as an example. And instead of looking at someone who appears to be presenting male to me and me saying, oh yeah, he blah, blah, blah. I'll be like real quick and just super casual so that it doesn't seem like it's a weird big thing to them. It's just sort of like, oh, uh, remind me, what are your pronouns? And then they'll say, I'm gonna, okay, and throw them into the conversation. Um, so something like that, just making sure that the dialogue around parts of identity is, is um, well, I don't wanna say easy because it's not easy, but that it, it's it's regular. It's something that we can do and that we can do it safely. And in, in Lumen terminology, you create a brave space. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think it's just kind of leaks into the way that I ways that I interact with them. So those are the first things that that come to mind. Great, thanks. And how about you, Zoe? So one of the things that I often find challenging is getting representation into a mathematics class because a lot of what we're doing doesn't talk about people at all. But I do give them a reflective journal assignment that they have to do each week, often about things like study skills, and I try to include at least one reading in it where it's sort of a personal story of, you know, a woman in math who struggled at first and then overcame obstacles and actually became a mathematician, like something along those lines, just as, you know, by the way, also there are women here. Also, there are people who struggled here. This isn't just a place for, you know, the white men. And so just little things like that, again, small things. It was an assignment I was already doing in general for other purposes, but I could just fit in, you know, one or two readings focused on representation there. Great, thanks. And Jesse, you want to round it up? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think this is a real creative space for us as educators, and, and I'm an, a literature scholar. So it's, I, I think there's a lot of flexibility um, when, you're, when you're teaching literature to, to work with um, inclusivity, but I can give an example. Um, I teach uh, Sappho in my European Lit class, and um, I have the students do a discussion board where they share videos with um, songs that connect, like, basically songs of heartbreak and longing and um, and that con contemporary songs that they like that they think connect. And so they do this sort of like informal analysis where they read Sappho's poem and then they look at the song lyrics. And, you know, I learned about like Taylor Swift and Panic and I mean, they go everywhere and it, it really like, they get it, they get, they get the poetry, but they also all of a sudden have this point of connection. Um, another project that I love to do, I teach a world literature class and I have a final project where the students have to uh, research and report on a poet connected to their own ethnic origins. Um, and it's just really cool to see what, what comes out of that. And um, so last semester, I had a student that worked with a Jamaican poet and she was actually translating Patois for us, you know, something that I can't do, but, but she was able to do. Um, and another student working on a poet from Southern India from Kerala. And, I, I would have never like learned about this, uh, these particular, you know, sort of regional 
uh, nuances without, and I wouldn't have known about that part of my students' identities, right? Unless I had thought of an assignment that allowed them to bring that forward. And so, um, you know, how, how can you make material sort of belong to the students or assignments? Um, I think those are the questions and um, yeah, it, it's, it's great though. I mean, it allows, for me, it allows me to continue to learn and expand um, in ways that I, I would not have anticipated. Awesome. Yeah, I think when we can learn from our students, that's, you know, one of the most valuable moments. Um, so for the next one, maybe I'll start with Zoe. Um, what impact, if any, has this experience had on you personally as an educator? It had a very positive impact on me personally because of the structure of these very supportive circles. Um, one of the main things we do each week in the circles is to provide feedback on each other's reflections. We're assigned two people to respond to, and they use the approach of appreciative inquiry, which is focused on strengths and on helping people grow by asking um, positive, productive questions about, you know, what other ideas you might have. And so I did this circle last fall, which was a difficult semester overall in that we had thought we were coming back from the pandemic and everything would be, you know, normal and happy again. And then somehow the students were struggling so much more even than the students I had taught in fall 2020 because they had missed so much. They weren't accustomed to being in school. So many were just, you know, disappearing. And so I was thinking, you know, how am I failing so much? You know, so many students are just gone. They're not turning in homework and so on. And so to have this really supportive group of people thinking about what I'm doing and telling me, you know, you're trying good things. You're like doing everything right. Like here are some other ideas you can have. It was really helpful to sort of be supported and to separate myself from the fact that the students were struggling and it wasn't necessarily about my teaching. So very um, helpful personally. Thanks. Um, and how about you, Emily? Any personal impact? The most personal impact for me, I mean, as we mentioned, is sort of wrapped up with confidence, but um, particularly with questioning the power dynamic, it was very useful for me because I, um, you know, I've only taught for three years and I am um, like they recognize, I, I get mistaken for a student pretty often, which is a whole other issue um, in terms of how I get treated because of that. But anyway, the point is that that made it difficult for me sometimes. It made me insecure about um, if I would be respected in my role because I'm a young woman and I was kind of like, is anyone going to take me seriously? And that made it difficult for me to relinquish power and say like, oh, I'm going to flip it on its head. Like we, you know, we all have equal roles in this room because that is what I believe as we were talking about learning from our students and everything, right? We're not the, the end all be all in those discussions, but I couldn't fully let go of that because I was like, I have to establish authority to be taken seriously. And that was really hard for me to grapple with for my first few years of teaching. So that was, um, I think the biggest personal, uh, the, the biggest element of personal growth for me was sort of being able to be like, it's okay if you know if you're a young woman and if someone doesn't take you seriously like that has nothing to do with um, your ability to create authority in a room and that's ultimately not what I want to prioritize I don't want my students to think of me as up here and them down here that's not the dynamic I want. So um, I had to think about sort of what was going to be most important for me in that interaction and that was I think my biggest personal grappling moment within the circle. Thanks. And Jesse, how about you? Emily, thank you so much for sharing that. I think, you know, that, but I, 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 um, I also feel like uh, the, the, um, the way the circle allows you to really understand that you are in process and you're doing a good job, like Zoe said. And I, I actually, this is how I pitch it to my colleagues. I'm trying to get folks to sign up and I say, it's like a support group for like teachers who care. And um, and it's really nice to work with folks outside of your institution, because sometimes I find at my institution, we are so overwhelmed and we get bogged down in the like kind of gossip and politics of the day to day. And just to have this sort of safe online space to, you know, I, I thought the circle would be a lot of work, but I found that it was, it was just really helping me feel good about my work. Um, and, you know, you can try something out and get feedback. And if you flop the, you know, you can report that too. And the facilitators love that because it's an opportunity for you to reflect on what you could do better. 
And um, I really, really think the facilitators in, in the circles are just, they were dynamic. And for me to have a kind of role model of appreciative inquiry that, you know, I could bring back to my colleagues and to my students, um, it really did empower me, I think, to, to um, identify with my sources of strength and, you know, to center myself from them and, and bring that back into my community. So it gives you a language. Um, to talk about what you're doing and, and to kind of sing it in a way. I like that. I like the uh, support group for teachers who care. And I think that's, it's great to um, have these communities of practice where we get together and can exchange. Um, but particularly, these are all folks who are, you know, trying to move in this direction of inclusion and, and DEI efforts. So thank you. Um, what I, I don't know if these are, you know, a little bit redundant, um, but what was your biggest takeaway from this experience and maybe specifically how it applies to um, your students, um, your students in your class, you know, how they interact with your classroom, things like that. Um, and we'll start with Zoe. So building a bit on what I said before, but my biggest takeaway has been this approach of appreciative inquiry, which I try to apply now to my students and also even to my colleagues, you know, in committee work and things. So the idea of really trying to get away from just pointing out flaws and things that are wrong and focus on talking about what is right and sort of inspiring people to do better with positive feedback and I haven't mastered it at all, but we practice it every week in the Lumen circles, right? You're trying to give feedback to colleagues and I don't, I still find it very hard somehow because I'm so ingrained in, you know, the idea of giving feedback by pointing out something wrong. And so it's sort of a whole mindset change that I'm really trying to work on personally and apply to my students as well. That's good. I like that positive approach. Um, Jesse, how about you? A big, your biggest takeaway? Um, I think that, um, I, I mean, I, I'm in an institutional culture where we're like understaffed and feel like, you know, kind of always in budget crisis and we're, we're always so overwhelmed and like, and, and I think that, um, I mean, this is like the old sort of self-care thing, but like, if you care about it, you have to spend a little bit of time working on it. And I think that committing to sign up to a professional development experience. And I think these circles in particular work really, they're not like intrusive, there's flexibility within it, there's compassion on the part of the facilitators. Um, it, it, it's really like can like um, revive you. And, and um, I think that, that that's really my take. Even this semester, I didn't do a circle because I have all this administrative stuff. And I'm like, you know what, I, I miss that. And I, I think I need it. So can I prioritize that for next next semester and I think that you know it's the old like you got to put your own mask on before the other people but I think the circle gives you an opportunity um, to do that work and, and that's really where the magic happens and yeah thanks so yeah improve yourself so that you can improve your, your students and Emily your biggest takeaway Mine, um, I think, came out of the power dynamic problem that I described a moment ago, which was um, making the whole thing a dialogue. Like, I, if I, I don't want to assume what they know or what they want or what they need. Just ask, like, just talk to them. And I made some, some, like, um, I'm forgetting the term for it, but there's like uh, assignments that you can do where you're giving them feedback that aren't actually graded, but it's just sort of an opportunity for you to give that feedback. And I would make the theme of those like, what's going well for you in this class so far? What do you want to see more of? Um, if you, if you know, if we threw away the syllabus right now and you had to create a unit, like what would it be on? And they're not graded, so they're you know, I can give them grammar feedback in terms of it's a composition class, but at the same time, I'm getting all of this information from them that I wouldn't have ever thought of if I just didn't ask. And it seems so obvious, like it's kind of like, yeah, ask them what they want, but it hadn't really occurred to me um, to do it in that format. And I got so much information out of that. So I think my biggest takeaway is really just, just ask them what they want and what they need. Ask them how they learn. That's great. And um, we're, we've got about 10 minutes left, um, and I think we can, if we don't have questions, we have a couple to close out, but we did get one from the chat um, that I think might actually be a good thing to discuss. 
Um, Loretta asked, did you have a circle for OER or how did it help you make the switch from tr traditional textbooks to OER? And I know Jesse and Emily um, both use OER in their teaching. Zoe, do you as well? No. So we'll kind of pitch this to um, Jesse and Emily. I Thank actually, you. I don't, I don't use uh, the software. Okay, we'll go yeah. to Emily. <laughs> I haven't, yeah, yeah. Because I, I've never found one really that links up with the specific content I have. But Emily, mm -hmm. you have you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, so there is, I didn't, I have not taken the OER circle yet. Um, I plan to, but I'm not teaching this semester. Um, I forgot to mention that I actually just started my PhD. So I'm, I'm not teaching right now, but I'm, I'm going to be teaching it again very soon. Um, so I didn't do the OER circle yet, but there is one. Um, but for me, so um, my situation, I don't know if I'll fully answer your question because I started without a traditional textbook, the way that I started teaching was just I would find open access PDFs and post links to them on Blackboard so that my students could access their readings that way. So I actually didn't ever have a traditional textbook, um, but I have taught a, a good amount with Lumen's so, uh, courseware called Waymaker and I love it so much. It's very, it's, I love it. Um, thank you to SUNY, of course, for, you know, giving our students access to that so that they don't have to pay at all. Um, but just a quick rundown on that is that it'll, it functions as an online textbook, but it's built into your LMS. So you can um, open up these different tiles that are sort of like your chapters. And then at the end of the section, there's like a little quiz that they have multiple attempts and, um, I won't dive into that too much, but I'd be really happy, Loretta, to talk about that more if you're interested in Waymaker. But um, yeah, it's it's a great piece of courseware. Yeah, and I'll just speak, Loretta, to um, SUNY in general. So yeah, there is a Lumen Circle about um, teaching with um, OER and OER-enabled pedagogy. Um, but like I mentioned, we have a um, online catalog of about 120 courses that we make available for free to our faculty and students. And so if a faculty member is interested in transitioning to OER, um, they're welcome to do to take the Lumen Circle and learn more about that professionally. Um, but they can request through us a course um, cartridge to, to get in, play around with. One of the beauties of OER that we know is you don't have to just take what's there. You can adapt it, remix it, um, take things from different sources and put them together. And so um, that works within our learning management systems, which are now in the process of all being transitioned over to um, Brightspace from Desire to Learn. Um, but that's available to all, all faculty in our, in our SUNY system, if they're interested. And I think um, if there are more questions, please throw them in the chat. But I think kind of our final question for the panelists will be, um, what advice might you give to someone who's interested in either joining the Lumen Circle or just interested in kind of um, promoting inclusion and belonging in their classroom? And maybe we'll start with Zoe for this one. So two different questions, really. If someone is interested in these Lumen Circles, I would recommend they just give it a try. It is very flexible. I mean, it's asynchronous. It is a time commitment of about two hours per week, but they're careful to make sure that it really does stay within the two hours for each activity. They'll recommend a certain amount of time to spend on it. And they always say, you know, if you're going over, like, talk to me about it or just stop. So it is manageable if that's the main thing you're worried about. I know that would be the main thing I was worried about. Um, what was the second part of your question about um, just if faculty or instructors are interested in promoting inclusion and belonging in their classroom in general. I would say the main thing is just reach out to your students, just talk to them, sort of similar to what Emily was saying, not even to ask them about course related things, but just how are you doing? I get so much positive feedback from students for like a two sentence email that just says, you know, I see you weren't in class today. I hope everything's OK. Like, let me know if I can help. I guess that was three sentences, but like really very basic, low effort things. They say repeatedly how much they appreciate that tiny level of outreach. So just showing your students that you care about them in ways that are not necessarily hard. Like I'm not a very touchy feely person, but I can say like, you know, I missed you when you weren't in class today. So small things like that really make a big difference to students. Thanks. And Emily, how about you? Um, so yes, for someone considering a circle, I would say to, um, as we've described, they're not terribly time consuming. That said, I would make sure that you're actually carving out 
scheduled time that you plan to work on your circle instead of it being like the filler thing that in between emails you'll pop in to to take it off the to-do list i would actually say okay for this hour or you know whatever it is that you decide to allocate that day i'm going to work on my lumen circles um obviously i think you you'll get way more out of it if you're choosing to engage with it intentionally but also it, it can hurt the dynamic of the circle if you're kind of writing a one sentence response to one of your your peers so i would say just you'll you'll get out of it what you put in so i would make sure that you do put it on your priority list again it doesn't take up a lot of your time but making sure that you're being intentional about how you use it is important um in terms of someone just um the, the second part of your question i i mean i definitely agree with everything zoe said so i don't really um that's that would kind of be my answer but i would also just share the one of the tags from the lumen circle which is pedagogical partnerships and that is essentially a lot of the things that we've been talking about here um, viewing your class interactions as a partnership making sure that you're checking in with them on what they need what you can change um, tailoring the course for every student of every identity um, in a sense that yeah like a partnership <laughs> so that would be one thing that i would i would plug in there Thanks, Emily. And Jesse, any advice? Um, it's it's funny. It, um, Zoe, you had used the term touchy feel, you know how you're not really a I, I have been like called out as being a touchy feely. I was in a job interview once and somebody said, Oh, your work is very touchy feely. And it was actually sort of insulting to me because it, it, I think that he there, there was a critique embedded in that. And I think that the circle really, you know, it made me feel like, you know caring and you know trying to create an inclusive space and like zoe said like doing that extra sentence that says and how are you doing like there's power in that and there there's empowerment in that and that's actually like extending a hand to let somebody have a voice and you know that that's actually part of my like scholarship and part of my like you know my my mission as an educator and so i think that if, if you feel like you're a person there like in that space as an educator or not there, the circle might um, allow you to sort of feel more empowered to come from that space and to give you a scholarly community um, that where you can talk about it and um, you can explore that. And in terms of the inclusivity, I just, I leave this like, I would say like, what are the base things we all share, you know, and it's music and it's food and it's family and it's friends and, you know, so how can you bring that in somehow? And, and just yesterday, it was like our homecoming on campus. And I know they were giving out free food. And I looked at my, you know, we had like 10 minutes left in class. And I was like, you know what? Let's pack up and we'll go walk over to the campus center and we'll get online first for the food. And, you know, they were like really excited. And we, we walked over, it was 10 minutes, but it was this opportunity for us to just be a group outside of the space. And I think that the circle really, helps remind me that that matters and you know when we come back to class on monday we've had that like sort of shared burrito from the food truck and and i think that that you know it might just open the space for students to be a little bit more comfortable like talking and sharing and questioning so yeah <laughs> thank you i like that um yeah and we're just about out of time so thank you so much to our panelists for sharing all of this and thank you for everyone for attending um, and I'll let Kendra take over as well. Yeah, I just wanted to extend a thank you to Corey, Zoe, Jesse, and Emily for their time and their insight. Um, we appreciate uh, your, your time and energy so much. Um, and I'd like to invite everyone to join us for our networking lunch, um, where we'll be sharing experiences and participating in a group activity. And thank you everyone for your patience with all of our Zoom frustrations this morning, but hey, we'll, we'll be doing great. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thanks, everyone.